Hello, everyone. My name is Eric D'Souza, and welcome to the second uh, episode of The Western Wing, where we focus on some of the crime writers of Canada that are situated on the West Coast, uh, so both Yukon and BC. I have three guests today, and we're going to discuss strong female characters. All three guests happen to all live on Vancouver Island today, so we'll have a little bit of an island feel. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk about strong female characters, uh, a topic I also enjoy because I have one myself, and uh, I think it's a very complex issue. Um, when Winona and I were discussing this of like great ideas that we could have for uh, the Western Wing, that was one of the first subjects we thought of. Um, and the first person I thought of asking to be on this panel was Tara Moss. So uh, Tara is an award-winning author and um, she's written I counted 13. Is that still correct? Yeah, I've, I've written number 14, but it hasn't come out yet, so it doesn't count. So, so 13 books, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, published in 18 countries and 13 languages. Um, her uh, first character, Makeda van der Waal, uh, is considered a feminist um, heroine. And I think it's probably safe to say at this point in your career, Tara, you're a, a feminist icon yourself. So oh, it's an honor you. to have you here today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here on the panel. Uh, I, I know uh, you requested too that we give some uh, sort of visual description of ourselves. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll go first since I talked first. Um, it's not so flattering though. Uh, <laughs> Middle-aged man with receding hairline. Uh, I did wear a nice shirt today for this event and I have a green background. Love it. Uh, Tara, would you like to go? <laughs> sure. Um, my name is Tara Moss. My pronouns are she and her. I'm coming to you from the Lekwungen territory here in Victoria, BC. And what you can see right now is my fighting red lipstick um, that I'm wearing. Um, so bright red lips, big teeth. I've got long salt and pepper, uh, dark hair, and I am sitting right now in my wheelchair. I'm a disabled woman, though you can't really see the wheelchair. You see the very top. Um, and behind me, there is a gold vintage screen. Um, it's got some bird life on it. And you can see a poster from one of my novels and also the book, The War Widow, which is my most recent book. So uh, welcome everyone. And I hope that um, anyone with visual impairment enjoys these little accessibility descriptions. I look forward to hearing what Ardell and Joanna have to say about their descriptions as well. <laughs> Big, I've got a big mouth and big teeth. That's what I'm going to leave you with as the overall impression. <laughs> uh, Joanna, I'll introduce you next. Uh, Joanna and I have a unique relationship in that uh, with my work from Crime Writers of Canada, I do a lot of interviewing. Uh, Joanna is the host and organizer of JCV uh, Art Studios in the dressing room and, and a podcaster. Uh, I just had the honor of uh, hosting her book launch for her uh, second book. And... Uh, Half the time we talk to each other, it's either I'm interviewing Joanna or Joanna's interviewing me. So, uh, Joanna, would you like to give a description of yourself and say hi? Hey, I'm Joanna Vanderfluck. Uh, I'm, I say, 50-ish. I have long white hair. I've had white hair, I'd say, since mid-20s. And it was about, oh gosh three years ago before the pandemic when I just thought right? <laughs> I'm going to embrace this white hair okay uh, I am sitting in my favorite um, moss green chair and behind me I have a white fireplace with a I do you call that a white shelf <laughs> okay <laughs> and um, family pictures and some fashion magazine uh, books in the left hand corner and I'm coming to you from Schooner Cove, and I'm really excited to be here with you, Eric, Tara, Ardell. I think we're going to have a cool discussion. I think so, too. Uh, yeah, so it's you and Steve Martin with the white hair. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Good company. <laughs> uh, Ardell, um, you're an award-winning author, um, photographer, and artist. Um, we actually met at the, I believe the first time, at the Calgary Writers Festival uh, when words collide, and I had the fortuitous luck of winning your book. And uh, reading it over, I was like, oh, that's my third guest. So uh, welcome to the show. Um, I think you actually bring um, an interesting component too, because your first book is sort of a mystery of romance. And uh, I haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, but from what I hear, 
Uh, your main character, Samantha, sort of starts as the damsel in distress character. Uh, Ben's the knight in shining armor, and then Samantha grows. And I know by reading your second book, I mean, she's on her own uh, and saving Ben this time. So he becomes the damsel in distress. So um, right, could you give a description and say hi, Ardell? Thanks, Eric. Um, um, my description is I'm 73, a bottle blonde, short cropped hair. My background is uh, a book brush creation with uh, the, the cover of Murder by Bits and Bites and, uh, and some hanging earbuds. Uh, the cover of the book has got uh, an Okanagan or, uh, vineyard in the winter. And uh, then the bottom half of it is shows an ominous figure in a hood behind some um, computer code and, uh, and this blood in the snow. <sighs> I love it. My earbuds have never looked so ominous, Ardell. <laughs> <laughs> what were they used for? <laughs> for the audio book. <laughs> um, Ardell, let's start with you then. Um, I, I thought a good place to start with, uh, because this is a discussion of our characters, is can you tell me a little bit about uh, Samantha? And um, at the end, sort of tie it into how much of you is in Samantha? Okay. Uh, Samantha, um, she gets her strength from her life experiences. When she was in college, uh, she's from back east, but she's going to college in Vancouver. And when she was in college, her parents were killed in a car accident. Her only sibling is a sister who lives in France. So she rather felt like an adult orphan. And when she graduated from college, uh, she was in a city that was foreign to her in, in that she was from back east. So she didn't have other relatives and that sort of thing around her. And, uh, but she did maintain one uh, other friend from college, uh, Siobhan Shepherd. Um, she went into uh, working into a clinic and, and rose to become uh, uh, the clinic administrator. And um, she, um, she, you know, during her rise in, within the clinic, she dealt with uh, patients physically, emotionally, financially. And, and then also on the other side, she was dealing with doctors and labs and hospitals and staff. So uh, she uh, was quick at making uh, uh, decisions and critical thinking. And so she became a, a, a happy independent woman uh, capable of making these difficult decisions. How much of that is you? And how much of that is me? I did work in a clinic. I was an MOA. I was medical office assistant. I did occasionally assist in, in some, uh, some surgeries uh, with laser surgery, but um, I did not become a, a, a clinic administrator. And uh, she's tall and young, long hair. The only thing we have in common is uh, we both have green eyes and left hand. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, Joanna, how much uh, of you are, to tell us about Jade first, perhaps. Okay. Oh, gosh. Jade, she's, she's strong. She's intelligent. Um, she's a lawyer, and she'll go back and forth um, being an ad hoc crown counsel and also doing defense work. The thing with Jade is when she's a Crown Counsel, she can't investigate uh, uh, charges or, you know, she has to maintain that integrity. So depending on the storyline, it's nice to have her being on the opposite side of the law, you know, depending on how the story goes. Uh, she loves motorcycles. And um, the sweet thing for me as an author is I do motorcycle illustrations. And it was such an amazing experience when I was writing with about her and her sister Sage to bring the art of illustrating motorcycles and weaving it in with the character. And so, you know, James Bond may have all these incredible cars. Well, I'm telling you, Jade is working on her second motorcycle. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's nice to switch up the bikes for her. Um, 
as much as she is strong, she's also vulnerable. And at times she will second guess herself. I, and she has faults. So um, yeah, it was, she gets her confidence by accepting her faults and knowing she makes mistakes. So she knows she's not perfect, but she's kind of, she's wants to help the little, little guy or the little person. And, um, you know, I think all of us in our novels, we want to portray justice. Okay. So, um, how much of her is me? Well, I know I could never be a cheerleader. Like I, I don't have that, that confidence of throwing myself out there. I, I'm, I'm actually quite an introvert, okay? Um, I accept my faults and I think knowing, approaching life with this idea that I don't know everything, um, I have a lot to learn and I want to learn a lot. That's kind of what Jade and I have in common, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, Tara, you have several great female you know, protagonists, uh, but I thought we'd focus on your newest one, Billy Walker. Um, I love that you put her in uh, noir uh, and experimenting uh, with a female Sam Spade. I, I don't compare her to her, but I think that's the natural comparison. So could you tell us about Billy? Sure. I first of all wanted to just mention that Joanna talked motorbikes and um, I had a Triumph Scrambler uh, 900cc and that was inspired by actually my previous crime novel heroine Mac Vanderwall who could she had a great roundhouse kick and rode a fast motorbike and it was a Triumph Scrambler so um, so yeah all across how fantastic these uh, heroines are on their bikes um, my latest heroine, Billy Walker, is a little bit different though. She's uh, living in the 1940s and she drives a fast car rather than a motorbike. And that is a Willys Roadster, a 1930s car. She likes it top down. Um, and there's great descriptions in the book of just the freedom she experiences on the road, especially in a world where obviously women can drive in the 40s, but a woman behind the wheel, especially of a, a nice car, a fast car, is still a little bit um, atypical and and treated with a little bit of suspicion by the, the local constabulary, uh, let's just say. So she's a really fun uh, character to write in a lot of ways, including loving speed. Um, she's been described, uh, I think, fairly aptly as a um, fast talking, fast driving, champagne swilling, Nazi hunter, uh, investigator and um yeah she's kind of part of a girl gang i want to be i want to be in with you know she's she's the kind of woman you do want to go and have a champagne cocktail with at the dancers which is in the book a reference there to the the philip marlowe um series of course with chandler and um I guess if I was to describe her roughly um, visually I'd say she does look a fair bit like Ida von Munster who's the model on this cover a little bit like if Ava Gardner the real life one not the Hollywood one but an, if an Ava Gardner like woman was Philip Marlowe or Sam Spade um, that's kind of what you're looking at you're looking at uh, the women of the time in the 40s who were incredibly resourceful, incredibly resilient um, and strong and very, um, very determined. So she's she's a product of her time in many respects, but she's also a bit ahead of her time, as a lot of women were. Uh, she's inspired really by a lot of the real life um, women who were in the 1940s and did extraordinary things that we, for the most part, have not heard about. Uh, when I was doing research for Billy Walker, I came up with uh, again and again with this um, reality that women were private investigators at the time. That wasn't the norm, but they existed and they operated. Um, and they just weren't generally written about in the contemporary fiction of the time. The characters were male uh, that we, we read about and were popularized. The women did exist. Um, and so Billy Walker is an example of that, you know, that that type of woman. She's uh, opened her uh, late father's investigation agency after returning from Europe, where she was working as a war reporter. So she's already got a few um, 
you know, experiences under her belt, to say the least, uh, by the time she's returned from Europe to Australia, Sydney, Australia, where the book is set. Um, she reopens that agency and has to not only deal with the cases, um, and one of the cases that that book, uh, The War Widow, focuses on, really becomes a lot more complex and dangerous than we would uh, have anticipated at the start. Not only that, but she has to deal with the social pressures at the time where um, women working, particularly as their own bosses, really unusual. And she has a marvelous assistant who's a returned vet who's come back with a disability, his hand is injured. So the army doesn't want him. And she has this beautiful secretary. <laughs> so there's a there's realism in the book, but it is, you know, some people might say it's a bit of a, a femi feminist fantasy. I'd say that, you know, I like the nod, but actually it's authentic. He would have been in the position where he'd really want a job. He would have been in the position where he would work for someone like Billy Walker. Their authentic characters are just not necessarily typical of what we've been reading about. So that's Billy Walker. Um, is she much like me? Well, you can take a wild guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot of crossover between me and the characters I've written about in the past 22 years that I've been published, I've written three primary main characters in series. They're all women. They're all um, you know, strong, involved in the action right up front, really pushing the plot along. And there's always an element of me in there, but also elements of things that I couldn't possibly do or be or um, experience myself. I've got Mac Vanderwall, who I mentioned earlier, the motorcycle riding roundhouse kick uh, woman, um, Pandora English, who's the paranormal heroine, and now Billy Walker. And I just think I'd love to get them all in the room together. <laughs> fantastic. Um, Joanna, I think we've already touched on this, uh, so maybe we'll read through this question. Um, but when we say the word strong, we're all writers, and we've all chosen to use the word strong in our descriptions of our characters. Um, what does strong mean? Uh, I know when we talk about male characters, we often think James Bond, you know, fights his way out of, you know, three people, no problem, drinks with, you know, martinis all night and doesn't suffer in the morning, drives fast cars, much like Billy Walker. Um, but what describes a strong female character? For me? Let's start with you. Okay. Strong female. Um, I would also say being there being there for her fellow female. Um, I'm being that pillar I'm thinking of in um, Dealer's Child. You know, I have the, the sister relationship with Jade and her sister Sage, and they both um, have their, I don't wanna say the word issues, but they both have things they're working with, de dealing with. And so at times when uh, Jade is down, Sage, her sister, steps up to the plate and she's just, she's being that pillar for her sister and trying to watch out for her, trying to, to watch out for her sister, for her best friend. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I really, <laughs> I, I, I know I've kind of mentioned this before, but it's the See, for me, the person who I, I listened to her podcast again, it's Alan Alda. He has this podcast and he interviewed this forensic expert named Sue Black. And I'm going to try not to get off on a tangent here. I'll make it short. Um, Sue Black was the forensic expert uh, dealing with all the crimes that had involved, that had happened in Kosovo. So she... I had some grisly matters she had to deal with. And Alan Alda asked her, you know, do you think you're confident? And she said, no. And I'm, you know, and she, but it comes down to, for me, and I, I think I, I mentioned this in the first answer was she accepts her faults and she wants to grow and she wants to be the best person that she can be, Jade can be, you know, but push come to shove because there are scenes in Dealer's Child where she, her back is to a corner. And it's basically a matter of, it, there's a physical altercation. So it's using her wit 
to how she's going to get out of this physical altercation when she's faced um, up against uh, a grown, um, a man, I don't wanna say a man, it's like her ex-boyfriend and she has to get out of this physical altercation. So it's being intelligent, it's being having a quick wit um, and being there for her sister and her friends, you know, cause my book deals, I have Jade the heroine, but I also have her sister, you know, so I hope I answered your question without going off on a tangent there, Eric. <laughs> you answered my question and some of my future questions. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tara, what's, what's your thoughts on Strong? Um, with probably with Mac Vanderwall and with Billy Walker, um, I've attempted to mix together what would be traditionally regarded as masculine attributes and feminine attributes. Of course, that's there's a lot to be said just in those terms and what they mean and what you know what use those ideas are today, but. What we normally think of as masculine strength is, you know, the, the stoic, the physical, as we've mentioned, and those feminine uh, traits as being, you know, nurturing and you know, all of that. She, she's all of those things. She's flawed. Each of the characters, the both of them are all of those things. They're flawed. They don't always get it right. But I've really attempted to get them to do things at times that we wouldn't think twice about if it was Philip Marlowe or indeed James Bond. But we do maybe think twice about when it's uh, a female character doing it. Um, I've studied a bit of um, self-defense just because that's life, life for me has involved that necessity. I've thrown a few, few men out of moving cars and down escalators. That's a whole other uh, podcast, but true story. And so I've had to learn um, some of the moves that my characters use in the books. And there's a mention, in fact, in The War Widow of, um, you know, of judo, which was only just kind of being popularized in the States at the time, and how um, some of those moves were picked up uh, by people um, who were outside of those schools, and how that involved, you know, using using your body to your advantage, even if you were smaller, even if you weren't as physically strong. So I do get Billy Walker to use some of those moves. And if we get a chance to do a short reading later, and I, I think I've just changed what my reading is going to be. And I actually want to show you guys, uh, the, you know, the fun of transplanting that physicality to a female character in the 40s using what she has at her disposal, which is maybe a little bit different to what we've read about in other noir, certainly. Um, but I agree with um, with Joanna that that strength as well is about um, you know being there for someone. And there's no question that both Mac Vanderwall and Billy Walker now in the War Widow and in the follow up I've just finished, they're very focused on justice, on on human rights and justice, and just trying to improve things for people who are in really dire straits. And that's a strength I think that shines above. All of the physicality and great action sequences you can write in. I do really enjoy those action sequences, but at its heart, it's really about um, surviving the situation so you can make some um, some right, or so, some wrong righted, so that you can bring justice to the situation. And that's what's most motivating. Thank you. Now, Ardell, um, I think Samantha is maybe the most. Um, uh, maybe position, not in position to be dealing with the forces that she is going to deal with, uh, especially uh, reading your second book. It's like, wow, she's up against the wall, really. So where does she find her strength? Um, well, I think uh, her strength comes from her life experiences, as I, I mentioned before. Uh, but um, what um, she, she doesn't, um, she, she's never involved in an actual physical altercation where she has to um, uh, you know, uh, be in contact with somebody. In the first book, A Person of Interest, she does have to think quick and, and make a decision between fight and flight. And uh, she wisely does the flight thing and does it very well <laughs> for a long period of time, uh, days in, in fact. Um, but uh, in Murder by Bits and Bites, uh, the strength that she exhibits is in um, dealing with the disappearance 
of her husband and assumed murder because of the evidence, the physical evidence that's found. Uh, and dealing with that grief, uh, joining the ranks of the, of the uh, disappeared, the mourners for the disappeared, and then having his best friend being accused of his murder and a conspiracy to, uh, for corporate espionage, uh, she has to defend this friend because she feels he is being wrongly accused and he isn't there to defend himself because he's disappeared. And the, of course, the police feel he's fled because he's guilty. And uh, Samantha feels that it's something else. So she's balancing grief with anger and, and forging ahead, trying to get over her grief and deal with the loss of her husband and, and also uh, trying to uh, uh, vindicate uh, uh, Jerry. So uh, uh, that's, that's where she gets her strength is, is being, to, uh, being able to uh, handle these two extremely heavy loads at the same time. Uh, I don't think I want to answer my, or sorry, I don't want to ask my next question because I think you've more or less answered it. So I'm going to leave it open. If any of you have any comments, you could add to it. But my question was, how does your female protagonist deal with violent confrontations? As I said, I think you've pretty much answered it already. But if you had any comments that you'd like to add, uh, please. If not, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> I, just to, I just want to quickly mention that I... Um... Oh. It, when when writing about uh, oh Joanna's just popped off there for a sec. Um, Would you like the question? <laughs> she didn't, <laughs> like, didn't want to talk about it. No, I think um, I think there's a wonderful history of um, central female characters in crime fiction who use primarily their minds, their brains, and not their physical person to um, survive situations. And bring justice and you know i think of you know miss marple and i think of uh the, the teacup mystery tradition um and that golden age uh tradition where and same with perot for that matter i mean he wasn't a man of great physical uh prowess it was about his mind and i think that's a wonderful tradition um for the most part, what I see there is that the male characters tended to be professionals and the females were painted as amateurs, which I think is is interesting. Um, so you had your, you know, you had your guy you went to who was a professional or there was the woman who just happened to know everything happening in the village, right? Um, there's a wonderful tradition there, but I wanted myself to quite intentionally subvert that in my work, mostly because I'm well placed to enjoy writing action sequences and read them it's something that i personally enjoy um very physical uh, even now that i'm using a wheelchair for example i'm super physical i'm getting out into the world all the time and kind of like you know um i'm a very physical person and so bringing that to the page with a female character has just brought its extra little fun challenges because you have to think about how they're going to manage the situation you know there, there's for example Billy Walker using a hat pin. You know, she's been pummeled to the ground by a thug. She's gonna slip out her hat pin. It's 1940s, everyone's going to be wearing a hat. And she's gonna stick that through the Achilles of the, you know, her attacker. Like he's gonna know about that. That's gonna bring him down. So it's um, kind of fun and also entertaining when you're reading a book, but also it's gotta have that authenticity. Look, what would she really have done? What would she really be capable of? She's not a superhero. She doesn't have supernatural powers. Um, it has to be things that are at her disposal. And I think that's kind of fun. And what we enjoy about, say, a Jason Bourne character, you know, he's using a toaster and a newspaper to, you know, in an attack and things like that. Um, taking that into Billy Walker's world has been part of the joy of writing those action sequences, trying to make it something she could physically have done as a um you know as a healthy active woman of her age in the 1940s with what she has at her disposal um so i think that's kind of a fun element it doesn't take away from the miss marple or teacup or older characters i love that tradition but i did want to kind of subvert the expectation that a female character couldn't do something that jason bourne could do for example yeah. any thoughts or anything you'd like to add joanna or ardell 
I my, think she covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> my my internet was flashing unstable and everyone froze. So I didn't want you to see me moving closer. I'm just about on top of the router. Okay. <laughs> I love Scooter Cove, but <laughs> the Wi-Fi. Great so right, I'm sure our audience is used to it by now. It's been 18 months of this or so. Um, on on the, I guess my two cents of it is we mentioned James Bond be great action movies, but my favorite action movie is Atomic Blonde with Charlize Theron, and she kicks some serious butt in that movie. And yeah. at no point do I think like, oh, she couldn't do that. It's, yeah, she could. <laughs> but, yes. She's it's physical. You can see she trained for the part, and she's physical because that's part of her job. But again, she's using lots of things that are in the scenes to to fight with. Like that's that's what's so beautiful about Atomic Blonde and that performance and the way they brought that to the screen. You just think what an incredibly resilient human being she is. Yes. And can, it's, yes, I loved that movie. And I even found when my spouse and I went to go watch it, he's, he's watching, he's like, be careful. Be careful, be careful, right? You know, so yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, if she ever, if they ever ask her to do the James Bond role, I'd be like, yeah, she can do it. Oh, she <laughs> James make Bond's never been so tough. <laughs> yeah, she, she'd be the best Jane Bond. I've been wanting to see, see a Jane Bond my whole adult life. So <laughs> definitely. Um, one thing uh, and one reason what I, I, I picked the three of you is while reading your books, I, I noticed that it's not just a female lead that's strong. Um, originally, the title of this was actually supposed to be Strong Female Lead, but all three of you have strong female sub characters or secondary characters. Um, like Rick One Shyla, I think, um, in your book, Tara, um, she can have a book of her own. She's such an interesting character and um, she kicks butt herself. Um, all three of you, like you have Siobhan, you have Siobhan Ardell, um, her best friend, who at the beginning of uh, Murray by Bits and Bites definitely relied on. And uh, Joanna, you have um, uh, the sister, Sage. So you have, it's not just woman against man in the world, she has support. So I wanted to know how important um, was those secondary characters to you? Um, I don't know who wants to go first in that one, it's your choice. All right, I'll put you on the spot. Ardell, <laughs> you can start. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that um, Siobhan Shepard, uh, the, the uh, fashion designer model uh, who has her own agency, uh, she um, is, is kind of the, uh, the opposite of, of Sam in that uh, she's, I mean, you see her coming down, down the street She's a standout, whereas and, and uh, uh, Sam is is happy to be in her shadow. Uh, she's she's a strong person in her own right, but um, Siobhan has always been her best friend, and uh, she's um, she's witty and humorous, and she has uh, she has a way of bringing out um, uh, Sam's um, best side, and um, there there are other. Um, characters like um, in, in, the, in the business where Ben works uh, in the IT department, Nancy is one of the software engineers there. And she got there by inventing uh, uh, some software. And, um, and then there's uh, uh, another woman who has her own beauty salon. And she's a very, very strong character. And there's a housewife, not a housewife, a housekeeper at the vineyard that does it all. Uh, she's raised these kids and, and uh, she's looked after the vineyard and looked after the cellar and looked after the horses. And so she's uh, 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 an expert in, in a lot of things. So I think all of these characters, um, uh, they're all different, but they're all strong in their own right. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have anybody that is, uh, uh, except maybe the nurse, um, Tammy. Uh, she, she is strong in a sense, but uh, she is taken in by, by the villain. So um, I, 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 I think they're all a little bit different, but they all shape Sam. 
Um, I'm only about halfway through your book too, so I'm I'm not sure you have Fiona, so I'm not sure she's uh, gonna be, how she's going to turn out. But you got another interesting female character in Fiona also. <laughs> Yeah, she has her own characteristics, that's for certain. <laughs> uh, Tara, so how important was uh, Shyla? Uh, Shyla and the, um, the female characters that surround Billy really are, they're so valuable to the, to the plot and what happens, but also the outcome. So it was important for me that Shyla, she's a Wiradjuri woman, so she's an Aboriginal Australian woman who was taken by the welfare, welfare board when she was four. Um, and now she works in part with Billy Walker to give her information on what's happening in the wealthy families in, in town in Sydney, because a lot of the Aboriginal girls were taken and trained in domestic work. And that's part of the history of Australia is the stolen generation. So she's part of the stolen generation and now she has a kind of network of her mob as she calls them these other girls that she trained with who have an inside scoop as to what's happening in the families. Um, Shyla gets very deeply involved with this case, and it was important for me that she becomes the heroine of her own storyline in the book. You know, at no point can you say, oh, you know, Billy came in and saved the day and made everything okay for everyone. Shyla's really front and center in this particular uh, subplot or what ends up becoming quite primary, but the way the, the plot moves, there's this sort of um, a surprise where you see it's all interweaving, of course, and uh, there's these incredible um, indigenous girls at the end and Shyla's kind of the, um, the center of that that part of it they were incredibly important and like i said it was important for me to make sure that she was represented as the the really resourceful strong knowledgeable young woman that she would be um and, and if i look at shyla i agree eric she could have her own series and i would love actually to see her brought to the screen because i think that would be a fascinating um exploration of you know, life as this indigenous woman in an urban area in 1946, having come out of that stolen generation and knowing what's happening with all the wealthy families, all these wealthy white families in, in Australia. But there's also Ella and Alma. So Billy Walker's mom is, um, you know, a former flapper and she was she's a baroness who's lost all her money in the depression and still wears all these scaparelli gowns. So she's you know, every night she dresses for dinner and she's got the Marcel waves and she's kind of in one way she's that she's a, another form of resilience. We see that she's holding on to her identity as the world crumbles around her as as her apartment gets more and more sparse and they have to sell the grand piano. She's still got her lipstick on and her Marcel waves and she's going to have her sherry and she's going to get through this. Um, and her incredible ladies maid Alma and the two of them, you know, all the other staff have long since gone, but El Ella and Alma are really an incredibly bonded pair. So I love those two women. Um, I have to just read quickly the my favorite line of Ella's. Um, at one point, Billy, who works or sorry, who lives in the same building, they've they've had to send it downsized from their mansion to this these flats. Um, and Billy lives downstairs and she's had to come up and say, you know, I've been set up. There's this dead guy in my bedroom and, you know, I don't know how he got there. And I know the police will be coming and they're trying to set me up. And so all these three women have to get together to try to get rid of this dead body. And it's a, it's a marvelous scene. Very um, uh, it makes me think of arsenic and lace, you know, the sort of dark comedy. But Ella at one point in her very prim accent as a baroness says, you know, he looks a lot more like a body rolled in a rug than I was hoping. Ella observed quietly as she and Alma inspected their handiwork. Let's hope we don't run into any neighbors. The next residence meeting will be hell. <laughs> um, it's it's a way to throw. I mean, there are some serious issues that come up in, in the War Widow. And we're talking about, you know, it's the Holocaust. It's post-war. But there's these wonderful moments of, of comedy relief. And a lot of them do come from Ella and Alma and this relationship between these generations of women, you know, uh, Alma always, you know, the, the sort of the sidekick to Ella and Ella is just sharp um, and quite spiky when she's talking to her daughter who's, you know, dressing like a man, she thinks, with these shoulder pads and all, you know, going off to work. And 
yeah i think i think having strong female characters all around really it's it's what allows billy to do what she does in this novel yeah definitely she has a great relationship with her mom i think at one point she calls one of her mom's dresses old <laughs> yes, that's right <laughs> and she doesn't want to be called mom either she wants to be called ella that's precisely right don't call me mom you know don't you call me mom that. it's like yes. yeah it's a very interesting snapshot of different generations yes and fun <laughs> Um, so, Joanna, I've actually asked you this question before, but uh, your first book really does center around uh, Jade, uh, whereas you made a conscious decision in your second book to make it a Jade and Sage mystery. So how important was Sage and the other female characters in your book? Sage is, is important. Is, you know, I am at that point where I can't think of writing a Jade, a novel with Jade without her sister Sage. Um, because Jade, because she's a lawyer and she does work as a prosecutor, there are just certain things she cannot do. And those two, Jade and Sage, you know, they're, I, for inspiration, I looked at my own two daughters where like Sage, she, she's dealing with some anger management issues, okay. Um, because she feels she's, she was never accepted by her father, okay? I mean, I touch upon, you know, there's a, a line in Dealer's Child where Sage is upset because she knows her father wanted to put her in conversion therapy, okay? So Sage has these anger management issues where, you know, if she some, sees a wrong, she will react. And, you know, I make a comment about her grabbing a beer can, like I think it was a Labatt beer can, okay? So then where Jade comes in, Jade tries to reel her back in, you know, just like you can't keep hitting people with beer cans. And that's basically what Jade is trying to tell her. You can't, you can't just keep hitting people, okay? <laughs> right? You know, we, we got to work. And they are, they both admit, you know, separately, they both start going to therapy and then they both admit, oh, you're seeing a therapist too? So Sage can do almost like the, do I want to say what you really wish you could do sometimes? <laughs> but you know, like she, Jade brings, controls her anger where Sage doesn't. And Sage, because she has her own motorcycle gang, which is all female, which I, it's, it's to me, that's the empowerment, okay? Um, she can find out information to help her sister, okay? And um, Tara mentioned the generations of women. What I didn't expect also with Dealer's Child was uh, having, now the mom, their mom, Jeannie, she comes back as a ghost, but she's a child, she's a teenager from 1968, which was just, as I was doing my research, was a phenomenal year. And, uh, you know, like it was neat to show Jeannie being upset, you know, because there's a portion of the book where it's in third person. It's from Jeannie's point of view. And she's upset because her best friend won't go to this rally for, you know, about equal rights, about civil rights. So to show Jeannie, you know, fighting, going to rallies for civil rights, and then taking the story to Jade and Sage, where Sage is dealing with issues where people won't accept her. You know, it it was really cool to follow that chain, you know, as one of the, I won't say subplots, but, you know, storylines in Dealer's Child. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm going a similar journey as you, as um, I have, uh, you know, my protagonist is uh, Suzanne Rickson. Um, and she has two daughters and sort of a theme that continues to go through it and i can't help it, it's just there is her relationship with her daughters and uh, how it's developed and now that one of them is a mother now um you know, stealing from my own relationship was my mom gives me advice that sometimes i don't want to hear and, yeah relationships there seem to be the backbone of even literature today and crime literature it, it's such a major part of it um i did have one last question to ask everybody but i would enjoy reading from all of you too um, Ardell, would you be okay to start again? 
uh, with the reading or with uh, the last question? Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'm saving the last question. <laughs> Would you like to? Oh, you're saving the last question. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just bring it up here. Okay. Uh, uh, this is from Murder by Bits and Bites, and I've deleted a couple of lines because they require a uh, backstory. So the preamble is, in, in chapter one of Murder by Bits and Bites, Samantha and Ben have planned a romantic weekend at their cottage on the Fraser River, but when she arrives, he doesn't answer her call. She sees four beer bottles on the coffee table in the sunroom, and she's pissed. <laughs> ben, who's all here? With her hands on her hips, she approached the bedroom off the sunroom. She froze in the doorway, his name a fish hook in her throat. Ben. Cables dangled from an empty desk. File drawers hung open. The contents scattered and trampled. Samantha's shock turned to heart-thumping fear when she spotted blood on the rumpled quilt. She knew this was no blood, blood, uh, nosebleed. This amount of blood had to be from serious trauma. Panic overtook her clinical reaction. Now she saw them, blood drops. She tore around to the other end of the sunroom towards their bedroom, but the trail led her out the front door. There was blood pressed into the steps and con a congealing pool a few feet away. Ben. She scanned the dense undergrowth at the edge of the woods and down the river to the west. Nothing, no one. She bolted to the riverbank to look upstream past the rocky outcrop, outcrop, willing her eyes to see someone, anyone. There was no one. Wheeling around to stare back at the cottage, her thoughts stumbled over images. Four beer bottles, blood on the bed, Ben's car door hanging open. Her chest tightened, making it difficult to breathe. Her fingers flew as she texted him, no response. She called his phone. The person you are calling is unavailable. She held her breath, her heart pounding at the seconds like a grandfather clock on steroids. Her world spun in a blur. As she swiveled on her heels, her eyes locked onto something white near the shore. She blinked to clear tears and jammed the defiant phone into her pocket. A sneaker bobbed against a rock a few feet from shore. Ignoring the bone chilling water, she rushed in to grab it before the river swept it away. It was Ben's. Blood stained the laces and clogged an eyelet. Samantha's throat constricted. The steel gray river, barren as far as she could see, silent as a ghost. Mm. There was no one to hear her calling, not another living soul. The privacy she'd always cherished here mocked her now with indifference. She squinted into the depths of the overhanging vegetation on the opposite bank, a mere hundred meters away. Nothing. Pitching over slippery rocks and sand along the shore, she spotted two deep drag marks that scored the embankment. And there, snagged between boulders, was a bloody shirt. Ben's shirt. Just as she reached for it, her fingers retracted like claws. She looked at the shoe she gripped in her fist, and she knew. Beautiful. You uh, mentioned audiobook earlier on um, in our discussion. Were you thinking of, are you going to be reading it? Because you have a good presentation. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. No. I hired somebody from Find Away Voices, uh, Christy Alsip, and she is fabulous. Just fabulous. Uh, also, um, you know, uh, as authors, when we read each other's books, we always sort of like, oh, that was a good line. So that, that mm -hmm. his name was like a fish hook in her mouth. It's like, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Tara, uh, I, I could see you like, just like, oh, I want to read my action scene. I want to read my action scene. So. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I was, I was going to read a different scene. And now um, this discussion of kind of how, how a female character who might not be as strong as her opponents might, might use her, her skills has just got me wanting to go to this scene. So um, in this sequence, Billy Walker has been with her assistant, Sam Baker, at an auction house doing some investigating into um, a, a case that they're on. And they've gone out towards the car and in the back alley, as they're getting towards the car, um, they are assaulted. 
A small gleaming knife appeared at her smooth right cheek, a switchblade held in rough, masculine hands. The nails were dirty, the shirt cuff tattered. She could smell male sweat and feel a heart beating against her shoulder blades. Billy absorbed this sudden turn of events and took a slow measured breath, shifting gears internally. The world slowed down. She bent forward carefully, tilting her head away from the sharp shining blade and pushed her buttocks into the man who held her tightly against him. Having expected her to struggle forward away from his body and not toward it, the assailant loosened his grip on the blade just a touch, his wrist slackening. Billy continued to bend forward and stretched out both hands as her head moved closer to the grubby footpath. Seizing the man's left leg, she wrenched it forcefully off the ground, pulling up and forward, cradling his foot to her chest. She heard a seam of her carefully sewn dress tear, followed by a more satisfying sound of her attacker falling backwards with an awkward thrashing movement. She leapt out of the way, letting go and momentarily free before a second assailant grabbed her leg and she went down on one knee, feeling a stalking tear irreparably. Now she was cross, very cross indeed. This is our way of saying lay off, a gruff voice said, and as Billy lifted her eyes, she felt a kick in the ribs, a vicious blow. In that moment, punct punctuated by pain, she snatched a view of a flabby face, a flattened profile. The two legs beside her with, were clothed in grubby chocolate brown slacks with a slightly tattered hem, not so unlike the pants of the man she'd yanked off balance, but these had a tatty dark blue. Unremarkably, or unremarkable leather shoes, low end. The grabby man she'd toppled would be getting to his feet soon, and he would be cross too. Next time I cut your pretty face, the close one with a flat nose added convincingly, as if he knew a thing or two about how that worked. Billy elected to stay down, huddling protectively, while the screaming in her kicked ribs subsided. She waited for the next move to reveal itself, and from the corner of her eye saw Sam, next to his car, catch a strong punch in the kidneys by a second set of assailants. It had all happened so quickly, so unexpectedly. Sam went down swinging, but he went down. Four of you seems a fair fight, Billy managed from her position on the ground, pulling a hat pin from her topper and swinging it at the closest man's ankle, pushing all three inches of it through his unmended black sock into the soft space between his ankle bone and heel and out the other side. He howled like a dingo and doubled over. She withdrew the hat pin and jumped to her feet, her raffia and silk tilt hat sliding off. You, he shouted at her, purple with humiliation and grabbing at his wounded ankle. He was so, so shocked that she had time to kick him roundly in the ass with one heeled foot, and he fell forward between two cars, letting out a string of expletives, trying unsuccessfully to regain his balance. It was one of her less elegant moves, but effective. If this wasn't a time for dirty fighting, she didn't know what was. Billy turned and glared coldly at the other man who was ready for his attempt at a comeback. She stood with her feet apart, the hat pin held in her hand like a dagger, while she waved it in front of his scarred face. Her other hand lifted her torn dress inch by inch. The eyes went from the hat pin to her knee and then her thigh and the top of her stocking with its pre lace edge holster, and then the barrel of her mother pearl handled Colt, now neatly in her hand and pointed squarely at him. Just above the barrel were her piercing green blue eyes. He knew better than to move or even to breathe. And there's much more, but that's um, quite, quite fun to imagine how she would handle things. As poor Sam, who's much bigger, is on the other side of the alley trying to deal with a man with one good hand or one good arm. Thankfully, his one good arm is pretty darn strong. <laughs> yes, he can hold his own too. Uh, uh, what I, I remember reading that scene in your book too, and it sneaks up on you too. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't read before it, but you never saw that knife coming. That just came out of nowhere, and it was it was a fun fun to jump That's right. that way. Nice and you pace. know things uh, have turned up a fair few notches uh, when that happens. Uh, so Joanna, um, sorry you have to follow that, but <laughs> I've read your book. I know you're fine. Okay, so I see all your lovely books. So I am going to show my pride and joy. That's Dealer's Child. Of course, there's going to be a motorbike on it. Okay, <laughs> it's not a Royal Enfield, but 
I have to give a shout out to this writer. She's an actual writer from Australia. And uh, she gave me permission and her photographer, they gave me permission, paid for the photo. And yeah, it's, it's really, I can't help it. Bikes are cool, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, so my piece I'm reading, I'll just quickly say Jade and Sage have gone back to their home, which has been torched. So it's this burnt shell and there's one room, one or two rooms that they, they, they do something they shouldn't do. They, they go into the back, into the kitchen and um, into the back living room, which Sage tells Jade, it hasn't been touched by the fire, okay? And as they do that, uh, so Jade's ex-boyfriend, who's not a nice man, and another individual comes up, um, have been following them and comes upon upon them. And the one fellow, Dennis, has dragged Sage out of the room. Okay, now this is Jade. Stop him. Osmond tightened his grip. Shut up. I gasped. Osmond, I said, shut it. He again banged my body against the wall. My head throbbed. I stared at him, not understanding wanting him to stop Dennis. I heard a crash from the other room. Where's the money, the audio files, the paintings? Give it to me and deranged Dennis leaves Sage alone. I don't have, Osman's eyes narrowed and he again banged me against the wall. Not the right answer, Jade. No, Sage yelled from the other room. Tell me what you know and I'll stop Dennis from attacking your sister. I squirmed. We only have cash. Cash, the back of the pictures. That's it, I pleaded. I'll give it to you. Let Sage go. That's not all Oscar left you. Sage screamed. Stop him. I kicked against the wall and tried to swing at Osman. He stepped back, letting me go, then backhanded me. My body twisted. I hit the kitchen, kitchen cupboard and slid to the floor. I pushed myself to my hands and knees. I heard another scream. Osman grabbed me around the waist and rammed me against the wall. My face pressed against it, my ears ringing. Tell me, he turned me around, his hand gripping my throat. Where is it? I gulped, you're choking. He flung me toward the kitchen table. I grabbed onto the edge, but still fell to the floor. Do you really think I came back into your life because I liked you, Jade. Mm. I crawled following the blood splatters on the tile, sensing him behind me. I'll give it to you. Blood dripped from my nose, all, all of it. Sage's house, it's all there. Let Sage go. Osmond stepped in front of me and kneeled. I scrambled backwards. It's called a honey trap for a reason, Jade. Find a pathetic woman starved for a little attention. He pushed aside the upturned table. Show her some affection and she'll tell you anything. You can have all of it. His cell vibrated. Women aren't the only ones who can weaponize sex. Rogue cop fighting the bad guys, sleeping with a successful lawyer, like a romance novel. He grabbed my coat collar. I had you eating out of my hand. I scooped handfuls of ash. Eat this. I mashed my hands into his eyes. He screamed, covering his face and stumbled toward the sink. I ran down the hall, sage. I stopped at a doorway where I saw sage face down on a charred pool table, hands tied behind her back. Dennis stood behind her undoing his belt. I'll show you my no. Armchair, fireplace, fire poker. I lunged, grabbed and swung. I heard the snap as the fire poker struck Dennis behind the right knee. He screamed and dropped. I swung again, this time hitting him in the shoulder. He screamed again, wide eyed. I stepped back, lost my balance and crashed against the pool table, pulling Sage over onto the floor with me. Sage, she lay eyes open but unfocused. 
I stumbled to my feet and moved toward Dennis lying on the floor. I raised the fire poker above my head. Stop. Osman again had his gun pointed at me, his eyes bloodshot, streak of wet ash on his face. I clutched the fire poker. Put it down. That's my my bit. Oh. Yeah, so. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. There's some some Charlize Theron in her too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the last question I had for all of you, um, as a guy, I'm always scared to say, I don't think men should call themselves feminists, but do you consider yourself a feminist and is your literature feminist literature? Uh, uh, Joanna, I, I, I actually, I have you pinned right now. So why don't you start, Joanna? <laughs> uh, I say yes. Uh, yes. And I, you know, Okay, Tara, the, one of the reasons why I loved your book mm. is because you said it when you said, Ella, she's a woman like ahead of her time. Mm. And my mother was a woman ahead of her time. Mm. And she raised our girl, like my sisters and I, to... Um, you know, she, she raised us with this, she said, I want you to be self-sufficient so you do not have to depend on anyone, okay? And I took that and I, pra I practiced and I remember saying that to my own girls. Mm -hmm. I want you to be self-sufficient. You do not have to depend on anyone but yourself. So yes, Eric, I would say I'm a feminist, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't, I'm going to do you a favor and let you go next. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, uh, I guess, I'm not sure if I would call myself a feminist. I, I just assume, uh, <laughs> I assume the role <laughs> and say I'm entitled to be an equal. I, I don't question it. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, I have been a doormat at times. Um, so I think uh, my characters, uh, they, they're not on a crusade to, uh, to uh, be better than the men around them. They uh, just uh, have the confidence in themselves to uh, assume equal standing. And, and they, don't, um, they don't allow um, anybody to, uh, uh, assume anything less of them. Uh, so I, I don't know that feminism is an actual issue in my books, um, but um, I think all of my female characters have the confidence to uh, assume their rightful place in society and um, don't take any expletive. <laughs> <laughs> We're all adults here. <laughs> now we're going to end it with your thoughts. Um, look, I when I started writing Mac Vanderwall, my first novel was called Fetish, and it came out in 1999, and it began a now 22-year career of centering women and girls' stories in fiction and nonfiction. Um, and when I wrote that first novel and the series that followed, I didn't actually know that I was doing that. I just was writing something I wanted to read and it was coming from the heart. I found it difficult at the time to find books that had central female protagonists. Um, I love my noir and I love my hard boiled and women like me, as I often say about that genre, we don't do well in those books. We end up as the, the dead body um at the end or at the start you know um or we're cast as the femme fatale and our sins we have to pay for by um by being murdered at the end um i wanted to find a central female protagonist who was pushing the plot forward not as a love interest not even as a femme fatale love a femme fatale but not as those characters but as the as the hero um and it was interesting that years on, before I really was using the word feminist myself, which I now embrace wholeheartedly, 
when I was in my 20s, I didn't, you know, kind of think about the word very much. It was interesting that after a few of those books, the series started being called an iconic feminist series and Mac van der Waal, an iconic feminist heroine. And I thought, what is it about the series that gives it that title? And it was literally just that she was equal to um, her male counterparts. Um, and again, the term feminist wasn't used in, in that particular series in an overt way. It was just by having her as a central protagonist who is just as capable, that became seen as feminist. Now I embrace the term wholeheartedly because it's that crazy idea that women are um, have equal value to men. <laughs> a wild concept um, and I've embraced that uh, association um, and written a couple of uh, books that are very much centered on on women's rights and, and human rights and also the rights of people with disabilities and from different cultures and, and backgrounds. Um, so I think that women's rights are human rights and anyone, particularly women, but also men who are writing that into the plots will find that this question comes up in these you know, this association, like your women aren't doormats, as you, as you put it, Ardell, does that mean, you know, you're making a statement and it's, and it can be as simple as, no, I'm just writing the women that I know, you know, or it can be that um, it is intentional. And I think over time with me, it's become both. It started as the former, and now it's become very intentional, um, trying to rebalance um, an imbalance I've seen in the storytelling of the period and subgenre that I most enjoy. It's what I love subverting about Hard Boiled is to have Philip Marlowe as a woman or you know, have that male character typically, the one who's solving the crimes be male or be female and also capable in those ways that we've talked about through this session. So yeah, I embrace the term wholeheartedly. And um, I think that, you know, the, the idea that um, we should all be equal and of equal value is something hopefully everyone has absorbed at this point. Mm -hmm. But um, we do see in fiction, uh, even modern fiction and, and storytelling that that isn't always observed or, you know, seen to be the case. So the more we can have these strong, central female protagonists, the better. And hopefully in time, you know, the most uh, successful female authors won't be that way in part because they're writing male characters or under male nom de plumes, which we still see. Um, uh, hopefully it will just be, you know, boy, boys are encouraged to read about central female characters just as much as girls are encouraged to read about those great male central characters as well. You know, who knows, maybe my daughter's generation or her, her children's generation will, will see that as a reality. I should clarify that I got over being a doormat in the 60s. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> Before you were born. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's not even, you know, a feminist fiction book can also be one where women are, you know, someone has been victimized. I mean, it's oppression exists. Mm -hmm. Like that's part of the point it is um, with a lot of our work, I think, even just in what we've heard today is pointing out that these things like life not always roses and oppression exists and inequality does exist and and it's what the characters do with it that makes them really exciting yeah. and strong one equality um uh quote that i i i think is very telling is ruth ginsburg was asked mm -hmm. how many females on the supreme court would satisfy you and she said nine <laughs> yep and of course it was a male interviewing whoa <laughs> it hadn't even occurred to him that it would be more than half. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's the re it's the rebalance. Um, yes. You know what would happen if there was a you know I, as most of us would think oh you know equality would be great but we have seen inequality at that level where whenever I walk in and speak to a parliament on human rights, I'm looking I'm walking down a hallway of white male portraits of people who have come before and. Um, yeah, that's a lot of that's been a lot of time. It's been centuries. Um, so, yeah, I think for I think there's going to be there's going to be changes in the future, and, and let's hope it makes it better for everyone, regardless of their you know gender or background or you know all all of those things. And it's going to have to be some rebalance for that to happen. I would say. I love that Ruth Ginsburg quote. It's great. <laughs> Well, I think on that note, we will leave it at that. Uh, we could probably talk for a few more hours, but uh, 
<laughs> we can't expect our audience to keep listening. So uh, it was a pleasure having all three of you as guests today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. So thank you very much, Tara, Ar Ardell, and Joanna. It was a pleasure. Um, if you're watching, actually, I was going to say, if you're watching this on the Crime Writers of Canada web uh, Facebook site, I would advise you to scroll down a bit because there's a cover of Joanna's book. And it, it's it's a work of art. It's a beautiful cover. And you sh I know you flashed it really quick, but it um, on the website, you can see a very nice job. Um, uh, so it's there now. Um, it's Facebook. It scrolls down. So go look at it now. <laughs> um, if you're a member of Crime Writers of Canada, uh, just to mention very quickly, uh, next week we have... Um, Maureen Jennings, uh, a meet and greet. So if you're listening to this and it's the first time you heard it, there's a chance to ask Maureen Jennings, the author of Murdoch Mysteries, uh, a question or two. Oh, so, excellent. excellent. Once again, thank you very much for uh, attending this panel. It was a lot of fun and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Nice to meet everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.